Stop at this point, says the shadow. I've accompanied you in war and in peace. If now I leave you alone, you won't be hurt. You'll be lighter than leaves. City of strange atmospheres, Trieste. Today is in that summer of 1914. The old emperor, Franz Josef, had long defined it a very loyal city. Now no more. Maybe things had begun to change after the great agricultural and industrial exhibition of 1882 and the Oberdan affair, the assassination attempt which never took place that should have erased the symbol of that reactionary Austria forever, described by the Irredentists. Maybe things had truly changed when in 1889 many Italians of Trieste refused to mourn the death of the Empress Sissi Elizabeth. Not even now that Sissi's statue stood there these two years before the Sudbahn, the Southern Railway. The city had raised 100,000 crowns for that monument. The emperor had even stopped going to Miramare. Too many memories bound to that brother with whom he had had so little in common, Maximilian, who had loved that rocky bay. He had loved it so much that he had ordered a castle to be built there where he would live with Charlotte. He'd given the castle a Spanish name, Miramar. But now Charlotte, Princess of Belgium, had gone back to Brussels many years before, shut away in her madness. And among the rooms, towers, gardens, the sea, only the tales of those who had frequented the prince's court remained and the dark rumours which shrouded the castle. Rumours whispered by the people, even then, in that hot summer of 1914. A very loyal city then, Trieste, dominion belonging to Austria since 1382, when in order to escape Venice's ambitions, the city had offered itself to the Habsburg dynasty. Now no more. Now? To His Majesty's loyal subjects, Trieste is the ungrateful favourite of the Empire. Trieste is a city of contrasts and opposites. Cosmopolitan, southern and Mediterranean, central for trade, yet peripheral and far away. Gateway to the east, or a transitory point to Italy. A city where the three main European lineages, Latin, German and Slavic met, and in more recent years clashed, more and more harshly. A central European city of emporiums and commerce hung in the balance between Mercury and Apollo, who looked at each other from above, from the theatre and the stock exchange. Culture and finance. A real city or a non-place in which even at the end of that June in 1914, anxieties and contradictions marked by normality were projected. Trieste, as it is seen through the lens of the darkroom, that the very wealthy merchant Pasquale Revoltella, unscrupulous businessman, financier of the Suez Canal, collector and patron of the arts, had had installed in his opulent mansion generously left to the city upon his death in 1869 so that it could be converted into a museum. And the travellers and tourists just landed, all ready to embark on one of the Austrian Lloyd steamers, the biggest Mediterranean shipping company. A constant stream of people coming and going, crossing the square, 
throwing a glance at the statue to Maximilian. The last quinine purchases in the Sant Andrea pharmacy. Then the geometrical streets that characterize Borgo Giuseppino, one of the city's new districts which owes its name to Maria Teresa's son, Joseph II. Tall buildings and long streets twisting and turning, and the smells and winding alleys of the old city. Leading to Piazza Grande. Talking and walking in front of a garden which hides the sight of the sea. The music and the band. There are those who remember when only a few years before it was still conducted by Franz Lea with his waltzes, operettas. to Sant Antonio Nuovo, along the canal, the market, the bridges, the Chiesa de Schiavoni's light blue cupolas, San Spiridone, which brings together the Serbian community, a little beyond Borgo Teresiano, built on the old disused salt pans. If you get there at the right time, you shouldn't miss a snack, a rebekin. sometimes spice smells like the ones that envelop you upon entering Tozo's shop. Which sells exotic goods and sea sponges, tasty sweets and sweet-smelling soaps. And on that summer Sunday too, the bomboniera, so modern in its liberty style, is full of customers lined up for the Rigoyanchi. Famous for the scandalous romance between Rigo Yanchi, the fascinating Hungarian violinist, and Clara Ward, an American heiress who had left her husband, the Belgian Prince of Chimay, for him. A bizarre fruit of that fin de siècle passion, a cake, with an aroma of chocolate and forbidden things. And how many cafes? People chatting about politics and books here in San Marco. They read newspapers at the Café degli Specchi. They taste ice cream for the first time at the Café Tommaso. They chat and stroll on that summer Sunday between Corsia Stadio, Aquedotto and the district dedicated to the old emperor. Borgo Franceschino, where Pirona has been since 1900 with its cream puffs, new premises, and already very famous for the presents, the wines. And for that strange presence, the Englishman they call him, James Joyce. He has breakfast there almost every day. He writes a lot, then gets up and goes to classes. He teaches so many people. He even teaches Schmitz, Ettore Schmitz, who, since landing himself a good marriage, has become a businessman and, quite nonchalantly, 
writes novels, signing them under the pseudonym of Italo Svevo. Li firma Italo Svevo. It is a hot summer, that of 1914, and if the trees at the Ferdinandeo or the Passaggio Sant'Andrea, a pleasant retreat for Trieste's English community, do not offer enough relief, there is a weather treatment, seawater and sunbathing, recommended by the most popular doctors. The 28th of June, 1914. It's almost evening. A telegram from Vienna. The newspaper, Il Piccolo, publishes a special edition that is handed out free. At Sarajevo, the heir to the Habsburg throne, Franz Ferdinand, and his wife Sofia, Duchess of Hohenberg, have been assassinated. Within one month, Trieste has become a barrack city. Thousands of drafted men are ready to leave. Some irredentists secretly cross the border. Ruggero Faro Timeus, Nazario Sauro, Attilio Ortis, Riccardo Piteri, Attilio Tamaro, Teodoro Maia, the owner of the newspaper Il Piccolo. People are confused. In their mind's eye, they keep seeing the coffins of the imperial couple landing at the pier Molo San Carlo, unloaded from the Viribus Unitis, the fleet's flagship, built in record time in the San Marco dockyard of the Stabilimento Tecnico Triestino, launched by the imperial couple in 1911. And then the funeral procession, from Piazza Grande to Via del Corso, to the Piazza della Caserma and up to the Sudbahn, between two rows of gendarmes, foot soldiers, seamen and firefighters. Along the way, black-edged flags and black drapes. Along the pavements, there are men with hats in hand, women in black. And then summer, which returns with its slow rhythm. At the end of July, the Gran Serraglio, the big menagerie, arrives in Trieste, at Barcola. Every day a big crowd, and everyone talks of the beasts, the elephants and camels, the ten tigers, and, of course, about the forthcoming holidays. Some mention the ultimatum sent to Serbia. And now the war. People get on the train and leave. The infantry regiments leave. The 97th, the 5th, the 27th, the Landwehr. They are almost all subjects from the coast, Italians, Slovenians and Croatians. In the interests of all draftees, the lieutenancy's draft notice reads, bring your own plate and cuddle, good shoes, warm clothes, and if possible a blanket. The front line is far away, they say Galicia. Some complain. To go to Udine now, the train takes eight hours instead of the usual three and a half. Every now and then, some stones roll down from the old battlements on the summit of San Michele that since the dawn of time has defended the entrance to Val Rosandra. They roll down the stronghold steps and disappear in the light of the sunset. Now here, on the remains of walls built almost 16 centuries before the time of Christ, there are trenches. Up here, during moonless nights, the sea is illuminated by the lights that the Imperial Royal War Navy has placed in Opicina. Austria digs in on the karst and in this second year of war entrusts the control of the railway, which passes through the valley, to a special platoon. Up and down, along the tracks, waiting, in silence, upon this line that in Trieste is called the Saints Line, due to the names of its stops, Sant'Andrea, Sant'Anna, 
San Giuseppe della Chiusa, Sant'Antonio in Bosco, Sant'Elia, and so many trains before the war, full of goods for Istria, or full of people, on Sundays, leisure trains, Trieste a Pelle, a 50-minute trip to have lunch in an old Osmitza, a typical local restaurant. Era stata l'imperatrice Maria Teresa. It was the Empress Maria Teresa who had allowed the peasant farmers to sell their products for eight days. Osm means eight in Slovenian, and then again for another eight, and another eight days again. Multiples of eight, over the whole year. A leafy branch on a house indicates an Osmitza. Benches and tables, glasses filled with Tarano wine, plates of ham and cheese, eggs and bread. And who can forget that soft bread, even today, now that the war is closer? They keep building trenches on the plateau. From Opicina to Bazovica, outside Trieste, they have already cut the woods to open up the view onto the sea. The farmers have worked to erect telegraph poles, to build ramparts and lookout posts. And even from the top of Val Rosandra, you can see the coast, in case the Italians should land. A surprise landing, alla Garabaldina, it is rumored in the city. From up here, if the day is clear, you can see the pontoons of Punto Stobba, where the heavy guns of the Italian soldiers are placed. You can hear the shots from May, when Italy also entered the war. The Austrians have withdrawn to the cast edge, behind Monfalcone's stronghold. High up on Emada, a fortress of bunkers and rocks, way up, in order to aim well at the city, at the factories, at the electric works the Officina Elettrica de Lozonso, at the Adria Verca, that had produced soda at the construction sites of the Kozelich brothers from Lozini, ship owners in Trieste at the ancient thermal spas with their health-giving waters. The Canale dei Dottori, constructed in 1905, has been flooded by the Imperial Royal Engineers. It drew its water from the river Isonso in Sagrado, and now, from Vermigliano, all the way down to the sea, there lies only a vast, muddy swamp. In Trieste, the Se Battalion Trieste defends the city. Volunteers, well-bred young men and seamen from the base of Pola. The Admiralty moves to the Hotel Obelisco in Opicina. Sailors on the castle, people will say. How strange. But General Cadorna aims at Gorizia. He wants it, with its avenues, villas, the nobles' mansions, the gardens with their fountains. He wants the city, not a heap of rubble. Around the castle there are still gardens and vineyards owned by the Chastelans, those who live near the castle. They're named this way, whether farmers or workers, sheltered in the village within the old walls. These new town people live in the city with its big avenues, villas, the mansions and gardens, and climb up there to walk. Via Rastella with its shops, up the steep, Cocevia, or the gentler slope beyond the Leopoldina Gate, that since 1660 has marked the imperial visit of Leopold I of Habsburg to Gorizia. The houses close to one another. The little church of Santo Spirito. The foot soldiers of the 3rd Company of the Landsturm March Battalion 13, the 13th Marching Battalion of the Austrian Territorial Army, left the castle already in the first year of war for the Eastern Front Line. 
a hell on earth, it is rumoured. From up here you can see the trenches, beyond the river Isonzo, on the Calvario, and up to Oslavia, and then San Gabriele, San Gabriele, San Daniele, San Marco, from west to east, from north to south, to San Michele, to the cast fortifications reaching as far as the sea. They lose and win by turns. They gain ground and fall back. The Italians of the Pavia, Casale, Perugia and Lazio brigades. The Slovenian, Dalmatian and Hungarian soldiers defend the peaks. And in the wood of Capuccio, there is even a battalion of the 97th Infantry Regiment. Many people from Trieste, Istrians. The city empties. A lot of people leave. Since June, 15,000 people, almost half the population. Gorizia, damned and blessed. Those who are left behind just have to wait. The surreal atmosphere of the bars and cafes that are still open, which the officers frequent in an outward, deliberate show of normality. Gorizia is and must be, still, the crown's pearl, as it was affectionately called by Franz Josef. The Austrian niece, the place celebrated for its climate, suitable like no other in the empire, as a winter health resort. Piazza Traunic, the Via dei Signori, where the elegant society went for their constitutional, the parties in Villa Coronini, at the Atem's mansion, outward and deliberate normality. Even the rubble from the bombardment is meticulously put in order. Alice Schalek is the only female war correspondent working for the Kriegspressquartier Propaganda, the headquarters of the Imperial Royal Press. She sees it. The remains of the disemboweled houses, she says, are guarded and even in front of the ruins there is a guard who does not budge whether he hears gunshots or not. Skeletons of houses. Alice sees the shells falling one after another. But, she writes, nobody moves, nobody starts. In silence, without claims to glory, in total simplicity, without marvelling at anything, they carry out their duty. They are defending Austria-Hungary here. Alice watches the scenery. So different today. The mountains. Oslavia's devastated hill. When a mountain dies, you cannot see it without being moved. The war has been killing men for two years, now this we have grown accustomed to. But killing the mountain is something so horrible that our nerves can hardly bear it. Alice's eyes are not those of the poets. Like this stone of San Michele, so cold, so hard, so dry, so resistant, so totally inanimate. My grief is like this stone, that you cannot see, for the wages of death is life. Alice's eyes are not like the ones of the volunteers who live and fight for an Italy populated by the ghosts of Garibaldi and Vittorio Emanuele II of Savoy, the gentleman king. Alice's eyes are not like those of someone who shouts out of fear and anger, you're the ones who wanted the war, drop dead, you and your lands. In Udine, the war strategies are strung together between Palazzo Belgrado, Cadorna's residence, the Regio Liceo Ginnasio Jacopo Stellini in Giardin Grande, branch of the High Command, the Castle Square, 
with the cannons placed there after the first bombardment by the Austro-Hungarian Air Force on the 20th of August 1915. The first of so many. General Cadorna often goes there. If the day is clear, you can see the mountain skyline from a distance. The front line, from Carnia to the river Isonzo. Tiepolo rose-coloured sunsets. Like the frescoes in the Patriarch's Palace. Udine, the war capital, since the king moved the court and the cuirassiers to a mansion in Martignaco, and the sleepy city has become a meeting place for politicians and the international diplomatic corps, as well as a magnificent place where everything is bought and sold. But in Udine, people don't make war, rather, they talk about it while sitting comfortably on the 18th century style red sofas at the Dorta Fantini Cafe, that refined place in front of the city hall's lodger at the beginning of the castle slope is called Dorta's Big Trench. It's fashionable to go there and have a mint julep, like General Cadorna, who drops by every night. High-ranking officers and pilots, reporters, and the most popular aristocrats and others of the realm, fascinating and veiled women, like Duzen. Old taverns and restaurants for those returning on leave from the front line and wanting to taste life again after months spent in the trenches, deep in the mud and surrounded by death. Theatres and open cinemas, they watch Machista Alpino, who fights the Austrians tooth and nail. And how mirthful the laughter, while eating away time with sweets and candy floss. Trains full of injured people arrive and stop at the station. Ambulances and stretchers coming and going, going to the many hospitals. Those who remain on the front line have to battle with General Capello's ideas, commander of the Second Army, who, wrote Rino Alessi, reporter and war correspondent, has many clever ideas. Toscanini came to conduct a military band on the front line. He played the Royal March and Mameli's anthem. Austrians answered with cannon shots. But in Udine, war and death are, have to be, kept apart from each other. I walked in the city all day long, like a wide-eyed child, seeing things for the first time. It seemed to me that I had opened my eyes after years of darkness. Shops, cafes, people smoking, talking and laughing happily everywhere. It was so natural, and yet it seemed impossible to me. I thought I would never see those simple things again. Everything like before. So extraordinary. At night, people walk in a circle of astonishment and wonder. It's as if the sky has come down in the streets, in the gardens, under the market arches. The dark blue of the night, here and there, is thick with electric flames. You can love a woman in Udine. The grand houses of the nobles of the province are opened. Eduardo Agnelli is in town, second lieutenant, assistant director of the High Command's fleet of cars in the city. Piero Pirelli in charge of decoding. Polished boots and uniforms may be by Chiussi, D'Annunzio's tailors, who have owned an atelier in Piazza dell'Erbe since 1868. In 
imboscati. Draft dodgers, whisper people. A new word, a euphemism, says Antonio Baldini, who is one of the war correspondents in Udine with Luigi Bazzini, Massimo Bardempelli, Ugo Oietti and Adengo Sofici. Draft dodger, a word to erase embarrassments, not a word like dessert, traitor, words that drop from on high, from whose height people fall. Draft dodger, a sharp but entangled word like a lash that gets caught up and ties itself in the air, so when it hits, it hurts no more. On the 17th of May, 1915, writes Bartolomeo Ristotto, a farmer born in 1893, I arrived at Palmanova with the first grenadiers. People had been predicting the war for a long time. It appeared to us as if we were heading to a wedding party. We didn't know what war was like. Then, near Cividale, an officer came to review us. D'Annunzio, a poet. <laughs> On the other side of the river, just in front of us, there was a sentry box with the Austrian customs officers. On the morning of the 24th of May, a heavily armed captain arrives and says, Lads, tonight at midnight, the war begins. You'll hear a shot of a 305 fired from Palmanova. It's the signal for war. So, I shout to the Austrian customs officers, What are you doing there? Are you waiting for us to arrest you? And they answer, Where should we go? If we leave this place, we'll be arrested. Sometimes in Aquileia, the mild October days recall an Indian summer. The remains of the ancient ruins are lighted by soft and shining lights. It makes for an unreal contrast with the shadow of the basilica that covers the graves of the first to fall on the karst. There is a smell of the sea in the air. Since the first year of war, the Italian Royal Navy had established the seaplane base in Grado. First in the lagoon in Gorgo, then near the port. The French were also there. No more. They left. Like the tourists. No more steam trains arriving the Belvedere. No more steamboats going up and down, none going to Trieste. Now Grado lives at night. The squadron stands by. I'm waiting for the moon to disappear before going to Udine to try my new uniform on. People whisper in the streets. Between the basilicas, among mosaics depicting motionless waves, and the stones left by Rome and Byzantium. Si attende di volare. Pilots wait to fly. The Imperial Air Force has already seen action. They flew over Gorgo and the Stolba. 
Italy counterattacked by hitting the seaplane base at Trieste, near Lloyd's Arsenal. Grado is the Heilbad for the modern Schulkind in the Großstadt. Grado makes the ideal spa town for the modern school child from the big city. Nobody ever said it again, nor wrote it. Today, the sea belongs to the new, fast and armed motor torpedo boats, the MAS. They too are waiting for a moonless night. And there is silence. No more travellers, no more arrivals from Bavaria, Bohemia, Moravia and Hungary. In 1910, there had been 11,235 tourists. In some hotels, people leaf through old magazines. Also the Seebad und Kurort Rado im österreichischen Küstenlande, published in 1910, whose cover showed beach tents arranged in four rows, the wooden gangway leading to the Badeanstalt, the bathing establishment with the big restaurant on the sea. Here comes D'Annunzio, appointed by General Cadorna, aerial observer. He who invented the word velivolo, aircraft, term belonging to the golden Latin tradition, light, fluid, quick. He flies, twice over Trieste, writes and drops leaflets. To free you sooner, we fight ceaselessly. The high command needs it. The trench wears you down, destroys bodies and thoughts. And so people look up. Up there, war looks celestial and clean. Il silenzio dei boschi dilata il tempo. The silence of the woods extends time. People leave, and it seems as if a lifetime has passed since the people came here for winter sports, sledging competitions, cross-country skiing, and then bobsleighs that the Southern Railway Company began transporting as luggage in 1911. And the hotels, what peace, built by Kajetin Schnabelegger, who died at the beginning of the century, owner of the Reibel mines, Hotel Schnabelegger in Tavisio, where the Emperor Franz Josef had also stayed, baths with pine needles, and natural medicines supplied by Johann Siegels, the chemists. Hotel Schnabelegger in Mar Boghetto, with the sulfurous water of the Luznitsa spring, brought there for the guests, and the Oman Hotel with a spa, and the Tomashof, 30 bedrooms, 12 booths for sulfur baths, a park two hectares wide. In those years, even Frederick II of Saxony came to hunt in his royal reserve, Valcanale. High up above Malborghetto, Hensel's Fort, isolated, writes Julius Kugi, Alpine referent of the Austro-Hungarian army. Up there, above Val Canale that has been abandoned by men. Up there with devastated bases. The ruins of the still indomitable proud walls. The Italians bombard it, but do not attack. The valley has two defence lines. Hintere and Fordere Seisere. From Schwarzenberg to Piccolo Nebois and then your fuart, piccolo yof de mezniot, montasio, yof de somdonia. They proceed, fight, remain, observe, in silence. The prisoners brought up here from the Eastern Front build roads. Sometimes they loot what is left. Those who died in battle rest among the pines. Up 
Up there, by the Rauna Malga, Lieutenant Kielmansegg had a chapel built by Hysterians, 10th Landsturm Battalion. A chapel. They dedicated it to Zita, that's the name of Karl's wife, the new Austro-Hungarian emperor. Among the trees further ahead lies a pilgrim's way, deserted. A lot of people used to go there on foot, up to the sanctuary of Lusari, and from there down with the wooden sledges. Not anymore. Only a stone angel remains there to indicate the way. And that dreadful silence. The wind and snow. So much, never been so much. In Tardvizio, the 31st of March, 1916, it was measured, 22 feet. On the border between empire and kingdom, Italian Pontebe is empty. Austrian Pontafel is empty. Across the river, broken down walls, open windows like many hollow eye sockets. Only this cursed silence is left, shattered by the cannons. Let's go, otherwise those poor souls will also die of hunger. For one lira and fifty cents in Kania, strategic area on the front line, they are the ones who bring ammunition provisions, freshly laundered linen and news from the villages to the Alpine troops of Tormezzo and the Tagliamento Valley. Karnic porters, a thousand auxiliaries with creels, women from 14 to 60 years old, always ready, after dusk and at daybreak, waiting in front of depots and warehouses on the valley floor, ready with 40 kilos on the back to climb towards the front line, the Timau Peak, Paso Monte Croce, Pal Grande, Pal Piccolo, two, four, five hours march, paths and mule tracks, in winter with snow up to their knees, in summer under the relentless sun. Stuff is unloaded. Some women remain up there for the battlefield work, bringing crushed stones, cement and wood to those who build the shelters, to those who repaired tracks and paths. Sleeping in a hut, a few steps away from the firing line. The other ones, a few words, a little rest, and then down again, sometimes carrying the injured or corpses on a stretcher, down to the valley, and then to the village, to the children, to the elderly, waiting, to their houses, to cook to take care of the beasts in the cattle sheds. Caporetto. At the end of summer, at the beginning of autumn, even the war seemed to stop and wait for spring. It was time to be on leave. 1917, 14th of September, Strasbourg. Second Lieutenant Hans Killian, mountaineer, gunner of the reserves, leaves at midnight with the troop train. In his pocket, the orders, to be opened once a journey has already begun. Destination, the Isonza front, Tolmin. The general staff has entrusted him with the task of examining the possibilities of attack on the field, locating the best positions and the best distribution of artillery essential reconnoitering for the general plan of attack. The 20th of October, the Isonza front. Italian soldiers go on leave by the thousands and return home. 24th of October, night, the Isonza front, Tolmin. 
two hours after midnight. The Austro-German artillery opens fire. It is very strong and directed against the command posts and behind the Italian lines. 24th of October, Udine. From Angelo Gatti's journal, military expert of the newspaper Corriere del Sera, chosen by General Cadorna to be historian of the Supreme Command. During the day, nothing new. But the gunfire is very intense everywhere. The noise is absolutely hellish. Plezzo. A German battalion activates thousands of tanks full of phosgene and other compounds. The operation lasts 30 seconds. 600 Italians die in silence, with their gear intact and their guns by their side. Udine, 10 a.m. General Cadorna receives an account of the events from Luigi Cabello, commander of the Second Army. Nothing alarming. The front between Plezzo and Tolmin. The elite troops drawn up on the mountainsides and the 12th Silesian Division has penetrated deep into the Azonzo Valley, little protected by the Italian troops according to the rules studied at the military academies, where it was taught that the essential thing is possession of the mountaintops. Udine, 10.35 a.m. General Cadorna orders the transfer of 200 pieces of artillery to the 3rd Army and says to go easy on the ammunition. The Azonzo front line Firing from the Austro-German artillery has cleared the way for the German infantry that spreads beyond the front line and cuts communications between the Italian lines. Udine, 12.15 p.m. General Cadorna telegraphs to the Duke of Aosta. The attack will be against the Third Army. The Natizona Valley. German detachments ascend as far as the top of the Kolovrat Ridge. They advance towards the Matayur. Small units infiltrate, strike, nearly always the flanks or from behind, and race away. Among the commanders, the young Lieutenant Erwin Rommel. The Italians resist on Kern, on the Jezakrat, on Mürzli, on the Zagradan Pass. Cividale's defense waits, marshaled in the Grand Furbergo Castle, Burgessimo, on the top of Castelmonte. Udine, 1 p.m. The usual report. During the night, there has been heavy bombardment with wide use of gas shells, which marked the beginning of the long-awaited attack. Around daybreak, due to the bad weather, the enemy's fire became lighter. The Isonza front, 3.30 p.m. The German troops are in Caporetto. Udine. Udine, 6 p.m. General Cadorna is quiet, smiling, unsure if the enemy really intends to attack in Tolmino or is rather simply attempting a bluff. 7 p.m. At supper I read the report. I don't like it at all. It is a very inappropriate statement about the enemy. Let them come, it says. We are waiting for them strong and ready. It is better to count our chickens after they are hatched, I say to Penna, Oyeti and Giusti, who sit near me at the table. Fortunately, I'm talking to myself, and the weather is horrible. Here it's raining. Up there on the mountains, there will at least be some fog. I go to the cinema. 10 p.m. Out of curiosity, I go to the headquarters. The lobby is illuminated. I ask how things are going. Not well. I look at everybody in the face. The enemy takes advantage of the fog and makes its units walk 22 kilometers on very hard mountain terrain. Our troops saw them coming up behind them. I hear someone talking of a complete rout. Sento parlare di sedan italiana. Excerpt from Carlo Emilio Gadda's journal of Caporetto, Diary of the War and Imprisonment. The first thing that happened was the blowing up of the Caporetto Bridge. It was blown sky high. Indeed, it happened when, up above, in the towering misty peaks, forces without orders were still steadily waiting to carry out the rest of their duty. Gloomy blasts arose from the valley, the ranging shot.
Then for hours on end, we only heard a low growl, and then it was quiet. This is how our soldier life ended. Brave soldiers seeing our mother country torn apart, ashamed of being conquered. We set off towards a harsh ordeal of prisons, starvation, ill treatment and filth. I suffered it all to end up in Caporetto where everything ends. With communications cut, badly lined up, untrained to face the new offensive tactics, the Italians are inferior in number, the action of the many who resist and continue to fight is not enough. 11,000 dead, 30,000 wounded, 293,000 prisoners, and then the dispersing soldiers, refugees, all three fortified lines defending the northeastern border had been broken, torn apart. Buried for nearly a century in untouched archives, the memory vanishes of the many battles of the obstinate resistance which blocked as far as it could the Austro-German advance. Caporetto causes us to forget the story of those who fought on Kurn, on Jesekrat, on Murzli, in the Natizona valleys, in the mountains and on the plains. And if a memory of the lancers at Pozzuolo del Friuli remains, nothing remains of those in Valresia or at Torre, in the streets of Udine, in Codroipo, on the Talimento, at Ragonia, Pradis, at the Clautana Pass, who valiantly resisted and strove to defend a retreat which halted on the river Piave. Cadorna, who would be all too ready to blame the troops of defeatism, was relieved of duties and replaced by General Armando Diaz. Junio. June. Report for the Imperial Royal Administration of Carlo Luigi Bozzi and of Lieutenant Freund. The cast is strikingly bare. Only the rocks emerge. There is no trace of vegetation on the sides that slope down toward the river Isonzo, more beautiful and clear than ever. There, where I used to go with my uncles to drink beer during the summer holidays, now there are only shapeless piles of scorched stones, among which the nettles have formed in dense groves among the stones, and spreading everywhere. August. And now let's prepare to make the last and definitive offensive. On the river Piave, things are going from bad to worse. We can't have illusions about this. The empire, the double monarchy, will soon belong to the past. Saranno presto cose del passato. Trieste, 1918. January. There is no wood, coal or lighting. After the umpteenth reduction of bread rations, pan de paia they call it, bran and sawdust, there are strikes, people take over the streets. June, the new Austrian offensive from Mount Grappa to the river Piave fails and summer brings an epidemic of Spanish flu. Thousands of Italian prisoners are closed in the port. October, in all the Austro-Hungarian Kurstenland, a fine mosaic where different ethnic groups have always coexisted. National issues lead to clashes. The collapse of the old empire is now evident. In confused, starving groups, the soldiers of the Austro-Hungarian army come back from the front line. The refugees come back from Austria, from Wagner and Pottendorf, a city of miserable wooden huts. In Trieste, a committee for public health is formed and the Imperial Royal Lieutenant Baron Fries Gainer hands over, on the last day of October, public offices, the headquarters of the railways, of the post office and navy, including the offices of Piazza Grande. A lot of flags are waving, everyone puts out his own. Those who want to see, or to have a better view, buy a place by a window, paying up to 40 crowns. Some negotiations are made with the Entente powers. A world is collapsing. November. Violence, political and social disorder. It is as if the city is invaded by the soldiers of the Austrian army, by Italian prisoners freed from the Austrian and Hungarian prison camps. Devastation and looting caused by common criminals just freed from the prisons. 
The Audace. The bold should have been called the Kawakaze. It was constructed in 1916 by the Yarrow shipyard in Glasgow for the Japanese Navy. Italy bought it before it was finished. On the 3rd of November, escorted by two seaplanes, it docked first at the pier, Molo San Carlo. Italy arrives in Trieste. War is over. San Giusto, the Italian flag, and so many flags, each its own. Molo San Carlo becomes Molo Adace. Piazza Grande becomes Piazza Unità d'Italia. Riva Cacciotti, Riva Tre Novembre. The new port is dedicated to Vittorio Emanuele III. Grossa Caserna becomes Caserma Obadan. War is also over for the Landsturmer, a veteran reservist, who, day by day, went down from the Greta Hill to Barcola Railway Bridge. He was the guard of the railways. He opened and closed his hut. War is over. A last turn of the quay, and then back home, near the old Austro-Hungarian fort, Kresic's fort, future symbolic location of the Fara della Vittoria lighthouse. War is over. Over?